you know, if your objective is to control the people you fuck, right? If that's, you know, yeah. that, that I could see why that would be troublesome. Welcome to On the Horizon, powered by Sex Work CEO. A podcast about what's on the horizon for sex workers and how to navigate it. Hosted by Jesse Sage and Melrose Michaels. Who misses free and affordable ads and social networks without the anti-sex work rhetoric? Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising and social spaces to the sex work community. They also give back to organizations based in harm reduction, sex work, and education. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their two products, Tris.link and Switter.at, are refreshing and well-needed changes in both presentation and mission. Both are free to join and open to all. In the words of an A4 user, from the policies to the language to the advice and tips, it makes such a big difference to feel encouraged and supported instead of policed. Check out their website, assembly4.com, for the word, not the number, for more info. (laughs) <laughs> all right all right here we go <laughs> episode one <laughs> you're here we made it <laughs> we did we have had oh we did this very crazy thing and decided <laughs> yeah. that we wanted to be together to interview to to record this which means we've been together recording this for three solid days three days 15 guests yeah three days yeah <laughs> for we've the first half of the episode extremely busy yeah yeah <laughs> um, last night we just like stared at the tv and we uh, like to roll on ourselves <laughs> so it was our reward for all of the hard work over this weekend it's yeah, been amazing yeah but we're very excited this is on the horizon for all of our fellow whores, we're mm-hmm. very happy. <laughs> um, I'm Jesse Sage. And I'm Melrose Michaels. And before we get started, we wanted to talk a little bit about our vision for the show and who we are in case you don't know us. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Melrose and I, my background is majorly in business and marketing. Um, I am a sex worker and performer, mostly in the online space. And uh, kind of my experiences have ranged from, you know, being a web webcam model, doing the premium social media thing, and then moving into a little bit more activism and education. Um, And what about you? Um, Yeah, I came into the industry in 2014 and did um, camming and clips for... I was part-time from like 2014 to 2017. In 2017, I just dove in. And since then, (laughs) this has been my world. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I started out doing clips and moved into phone sex primarily. And now I do in-person work and phone sex. And if I'm feeling particularly inspired, I might put out a clip. So you could look out for that like once every three months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I do, I do keep up the premium social media kind mm-hmm. of, but yeah, so that's my thing. I mostly do phone sex and in-person work. Yeah. Um, I came from an academic background. Mm-hmm. I also, um, while well, I do uh, sex work full time, I also run Peep Show uh, magazine and Peep Show podcast with my partner, PJ Tellerae, who's going to be on the next on episode. The show. Yeah. Um, and we've been running that since 2017. And I'm a writer and I'm supposed to be writing a book right now. So <laughs> don't tell my publisher I'm hanging out in the South <laughs> doing this instead. In a dark basement. <laughs> um, I guess now you feel like I left a ton of things out. You're so thorough. Um, I also have uh, Sex Work CEO. It's an educational platform that I founded in teach courses to kind of fill school gaps for sex workers. Um, and then also the Networthy clothing line which is a for sex worker by sex worker clothing line so now yeah I so feel thorough. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah so we decided <laughs> um since you know we've both been hosting these podcasts individually oh mm-hmm. and you have oh i have CEO. yeah well i had seen and not heard podcasts pr- previously but that's coming to a close as i get into that so yeah and so we started talking about what we could do together mm-hmm. and we decided to create a whole new podcast so here we are and one of the things that we really wanted to do is bring together our like um separate interests so i've never been a part of the business world i don't know anything about that um (laughs) i don't know the words that she's using um (laughs) and i'm not quite intellectual i'm a college dropout so i'm googling things as jesse talks quite often (laughs) it's great though because i feel like i'm learning so much just talking to you and going through like who you know in this um in the sphere and who I know and we're kind of trying to bring together those like you know I'm more of an in-person person you're more online yeah I'm from academic background you're from business so Mm -hmm. we're trying to 
cover a range of things. Yeah. yeah, I think it's great because a lot of the stuff or the concepts or, you know, intellectual conversations we're having, I'm not super familiar with. So I can ask the questions who some of the viewers listening or listeners um, might not be as familiar as well. So they're going to learn yeah. along with me. And then on the flip side for business, they'll learn along with Jesse. So it's yeah. kind of a really well-rounded kind of look <laughs> at things. Yeah. So we're really excited. So um, let's see. We... We mapped out the whole first season. So yes. the whole first season is 12 episodes and we recorded the first six. Yes. These last three days. <laughs> so if we're tired, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's why. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but we, the first half, we're kind of trying to take a micro view of sex work. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at the social and political climate that sex workers find themselves in now. Yeah. And then down the road, we're getting a little bit more micro into like the actual work of sex work and really going over and digging into all that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we can just kind of move in. The first episode mm -hmm. um, is the the kind of broadest uh, episode that we have. We're talking about the war on horse. Yeah. So that has been around just about forever. <laughs> yeah. So and we're, yeah. we're going to talk about all the nuance that comes in, you know, with that. So like not just a historical overview, but also like we'll speak with Carol Lee who coined the term sex work and what yeah. that really means. And then also thought scholar who suggests kind of a new perspective on the sex work as the anti-work. Yeah. Um, and we also have Caitlin ba Bailey to cover the historical piece. Yeah. Caitlin Bailey um, runs a one woman show that goes over the last 10,000 years of the history of being a whore. And so we thought it would be great to start with her and be like, yeah. what's it like to be a whore over the last 10,000 years? So yeah. she's going to kind of pull us through that. And then we're going to be talking about the idea of sex work mm -hmm. and sex work as work, and then maybe sex work as something else. And that'll kind of open up the world to what is this thing that's sex work? Who are sex workers? And mm -hmm. what does the world look like? So yeah, so let's let's jump right in, shall we? Yeah. Kara Lee has been a writer, performer, video maker, and sex worker activist since the late 70s when she coined the term sex work. Lee's activism spans decades as a Coyote member, an original member of AIDS Action Pledge and Swap USA, and co-founder of Bay Swan, the Bay Area Sex Worker Advocacy Network, and founder and co-producer of the San Francisco Sex Worker Film and Arts Festival since 1999. For several years, she has been focusing on an educational video resource addressing trafficking issues from sex worker perspectives. We couldn't be more excited about getting Kara Lee to come on the Horizon podcast. So without further ado, let's welcome Carol Lee. I want to actually first say thank you so much for joining us. I'm really yes. excited to talk to you. Yeah, if you can just tell our audience what, like who you are and how long you've been in this uh <laughs> industry, I guess. Industry, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, I am most well known for coining the term sex work. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think also for being around a long time, it's kind of both. <laughs> they, they go together. <laughs> uh, so I think those are the two things. But but I think, um, but really, uh, mostly for coining the term sex work. And um, I was just fortunate to be around at the right time and be immersed in these kind of the 60s or, you know, then 70s hippie got ethics that I expressed through my politics. And I was um, an avid political person. My parents were socialists. So I was a red diaper baby. I was a feminist oh. since 1973. Yeah. And I was just, um, it all brought me to that point. I was a, I, I conceived myself as an artist and I was, as soon as I started doing prostitution, which I was like, almost 28, around 28, yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty old. Uh, as soon as I started doing it, I just understood that this was going to be the center of my life's work because mm -hmm. it was about sexual politics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I knew that that's what interested me more than anything as a feminist. And mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so can you, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to go, to go back to that. I was wondering if you could tell um, the story of like the conference in which you coined the term that our sex worker first used it for the people who don't really know where this term came from. Okay. Um, you know, I wish I had a, a better memory of this conference and I've looked it up on the web and I can't find it, but it was <laughs> an anti-porn conference. I was there and some of my friends 
from Coyote would also go and pursue mm-hmm. Alexander. And they had so much strength and genius. And I always felt supported mm-hmm. by all of them. And, you know, it was very new at that point to come out as a working prostitute. That's what yeah. we did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, previously, well, Margot St. James came out as a former prostitute. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. That's how that's what she was. But it was just rare for people to come out as working prostitutes. There was still too much stigma. And of course, people were worried about the legality. Of yeah. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not a crime of status. So actually, you're not going to get arrested for, I mean, you, you could, they can arrest you for anything, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. But it didn't yeah. really like comport with the actual laws. So, but of course it was a, it was very scary and um, but it was something I was able to do, but mostly because I'd already talked to my parents about it because I much earlier worked it out that I could do whatever I want, basically, and they couldn't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I established that other people were more worried and worried about their disapproval and their broader family's disapproval. But I had laid down the law. Uh, <laughs> so that, I was lucky that. It worked out that way. It just was yeah. a coincidence that I was positioned in that way. So, um, yeah. So how do you think that, like, as you've been watching, like, the sex worker rights movement over the last several decades, like, how do you think it's shifted and changed? And what do you think about the moment that we are in now? I ever imagine there'd be, like, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sex workers all over the world, sex worker activists. Yeah. Well, like in India, I think that they are like in a town. They would be sort of almost like the government. They're an institution in a town and they give services, all kinds of services. So they would count everybody who they give services to everybody in that town as a member. So when you see their numbers, it's like 85,000 sex workers are in their organization. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes sense, though, because it's a totally different model of sex work. But then, right. other, you know, all over the world and um, there is an extensive movement of sex workers. I mean, I've seen people coming out for sex worker marches in the hundreds or even yeah. more than a thousand in East Asia in the southeast, in mm-hmm. Southeast Asia. I've seen it in Latin America, uh, Argentina. I mean, the movements are huge. And in the United States, we just used to have about 10 people and maybe like three in each city for yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And now every city has a little cadre of sex workers. And <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I can't believe how exciting this is. And also there's so many academics who are sex workers. Yes. And, yeah. Scholars and professors. Uh, and uh, It's so <laughs> exciting. I just can't. And I think that, you know, more and more the uh, the politics of the movement is addressing the needs of those who are most negatively impacted by the work. And it's, uh, I think are learning slowly, not everybody, but are learning slowly um, what that means and how that would, they would restructure their lives as activists. Nothing like it was when I was young. I mean, you could really reject. I mean, I remember something. I have a funny memory when transgender movement, it was the beginning of transgender nation. The movement wasn't really big yet. And one friend of mine, a transgender friend, came to the meeting and she called us (laughs) non-transgender. And my friend who was a sex worker she mm-hmm. just felt like that was an attack, like to erase her her actual gender by <laughs> saying that she's not transgender. That was all. Uh, well, I mean, using the term kind of makes the point of erasure, not that there isn't an actual erasure going on. Yeah. But what it was, was like make, being able to make that point. So yeah. it was a really valid way to talk. But the idea that she would get so angry about it I found that really interesting. Um, So there were always little things like that. And even now you go to a meeting, people don't know how to talk about users. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so right now, that's a huge problem from my perspective. Can't Mm -hmm. really come out too easily. When you first like got involved in activism in terms of sex work, in looking at where things are now, does that, do you feel like there's been a lot of progress and does that give you hope or do you feel like we're not moving fast enough or progressing as quickly as Um, you would have hoped? You know, I am just such a pessimist. 
<laughs> so I never thought it would be this big. I never thought we would get anywhere like this. Okay, I understood, you know, New Zealand, I guess, things that that wasn't in the beginning. Was that in 2002 or three? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then Australia was chugging along with, you know, struggling with some laws, but some deep, vague decrim in Australian capital territories. Yeah. But I never thought that the movement would be spreading all over the world like this. I just, I mean, no, this is way beyond anything. And mm-hmm. and also that in the newspapers, they call people sex workers. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the point. But the way the newspapers <laughs> treated us so badly, yeah, I, I was shocked. And the solidarity. I mean, there's still there is so much work to be done for sex workers of color, I think, who are trying to find more understanding within the movement and more more leadership roles for leadership within the movement. But but over the last two years, I feel like the center of leadership has been in groups of sex workers of color and trans yeah. sex workers. Is that right? I mean, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot of I don't, Yeah. I don't yeah. get around in some ways. Well, none of us do because we're all at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah, no, around. I think I've seen that. Like big movements of like pushes to to make sure that um, the leadership includes or not even just includes, but is like um, the majority of people of color and uh, more marginalized sex workers. And I think that's really great. What do you think the biggest challenges we're facing now are in terms of sex workers? Well, you know, my main expertise is mostly around political Mm -hmm. ideologies. Now, I mean, when I so that means I don't necessarily join the committees where you're doing care, community care and mutual aid. Mm -hmm. So I might be more inclined to join a policy committee. This is right. the story of what I'm really doing now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a conjecture, but um, yeah, I think that um, what I see, though, in the forefront is sex workers and taking the lead in community care. I feel like we should be teaching the world about that. I just feel like mm-hmm. it's an amazing strength we have. And Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I'm romantic about sex workers. I, Y'all are too. Don't yeah, <laughs> it's a sweet spot. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I'm even essentialist. Then sometimes they don't like you to be essentialist, like in the academics film. Yeah, or somebody does it right. It's not proper, but anyway, I'm essentialist. I do have these feelings that sex workers are kind of like goddesses, and that was so, <laughs> we are supposed to save the world. And, and we're meant to. I mean, I, I'm not going to really see. You. Somebody could take that out of context, right? Right. Yeah. And and they, they you don't have to write and they were all giggling. Yeah. You know? <laughs> True. I'm curious what you would tell younger people who are like coming into sex work now, if you have any sort of a words of wisdom as somebody who spent their career in sex work. Um, what do you what are the biggest takeaways that you've had from your career? If they start by understand, you know. A lot of the trouble comes from uh, imbuing all this the horror negative imagery so that when you suffer as a sex worker, you think you deserve it and you think mm-hmm. that's how sex work is. And maybe I have to do this for my drugs or I have to do this to pay my medical bills or I have to do mm-hmm. this because I can't get a job because something, you know, but or because I have a record and I can't get a dry it. You know, so, I mean, I think you can take on Mm -hmm. all the condemnation. And I I think people need to remind themselves of that, that this is not inherently some kind of bad thing. And that there are ways that you can work. But I also think that we have to enormously respect many people who don't have those skills or abilities. And, I mean, I would have a friend who's, you know, went through years of, of, of mental illness, maybe as a result of or connected to some abuses she's experienced at home. Mm-hmm. And um, there might be a difference between somebody in that situation. There might be. There is. A, there are different challenges. Yeah. Between somebody in that situation and someone who's had all kinds of other privileges, maybe somebody who's learned 
very sufficiently that about love and that mm-hmm. she's loved as a person, unconditional love. Maybe. But then there are there's a lot of people who bravely come from the most desperate circumstances who yeah. also can find a path. And yeah. I think it's important to remember, but I also do think people need to understand, especially when we're judging our, you know, sisters and cousins and brothers and blah, yeah. blah. Especially then we have to understand, you know, people have different privileges, different skills, and different talents. It doesn't get to be as easy for some people. It can be very hard for some mm-hmm. people. In the modern day and age, we know we have all this technology at our fingertips and all these other ways of communicating with each other to mobilize and things like that. There's also this, um, I guess, old view of sex workers to think that all of them are survival sex workers. You know, they're all coming from these difficult circumstances where I don't know that that's I mean, maybe it's a big majority, but I don't think it's a it's everyone. And I think that that also needs more understanding too, that it can also just be a choice. I just chose to be anti workforce or anti whatever that normal, you know, the nine to five is because I decided my time is more valuable and I want to spend it with my family, my husband, my kids, whatever. And I, I think there's another, I don't know, a breed generation of sex work. Yeah. Describe it. Finding what sex work is or yeah like not only for survival but also like this is my choice i just i choose this path and i think that making sure we can communicate between both of those groups in terms of sex work community is super powerful like bringing both the survivalist and and the people just making that's my career choice i prefer to do this well you know then some of the social workers they need three things when they talk they have choice circumstance and, and coercion. Yeah. Coercion. So yeah. I think then it's more like a continuum with those three right. points. Not the, the, the two are not good, especially yeah. if you're mm-hmm. talking about trafficking, because I mean, one one person might have felt a little coerced. The other feels economically coerced. But if you're yeah. going to take them and put them in a corner where you're the coerced one, yes. which one are they going to identify with? And so if you start talking about who's coerced and who makes a choice. Choice is such a difficult term because you're not even expected to make a choice to work at McDonald's. And, right. and mm-hmm. how do, does choice and work relate? I right. Think- also, this idea of survival, like everybody who's working is working for survival. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's right. true. It's a very broad yeah. like right. spectrum of definition. Yeah. 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 Like, we have to work in some capacity to survive so therefore like, yeah. that's what we're all doing like when it comes down to it so i think you're right i think that like a continuum and is is a better way to look at it and also like people move through those yeah those absolutely because you can you know at one point be like coerced into something and at another point be doing it you know out of necessity and at another point in your yes life, you absolutely know, so i think um, it can evolve yeah absolutely Studying um, work and studying theories of capitalism and studying uh, what sex work is work means in relationship to what work means. I think that's something we kind of all just didn't have a lot of time for because we, I mean, it's so obvious that it's work. We just are like, what are you kidding? This is work. It wasn't that for me and my old friends talk about it. We really knew it was work. That was the consciousness that was going around. That's what we mostly thought because people didn't realize that the outside world didn't even realize this was work. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know we've taken a lot of your time. Um, Do you want to tell people where they could find any of your work or find you on social media or? Okay, let's go for Twitter. I'm into Twitter now. (laughs) Okay. I've given up Facebook, but... All my friends are there, so I'll go back. Yeah. <laughs> um, at Carol underscore Lee. Okay. People, people know how to spell my name. L-E-I-G-H. <laughs> L-E-I-G-H, yeah. And I think that's a good central place. Now I put my link tree on my profile there. Mm-hmm. If they really want to look into me, there's all the links to, I mean, I, 
I run a lot of projects. I'm mostly interested in trafficking from mm-hmm. sex worker perspective. So I have a trafficking website, trafficking movie, teaching tools around sex workers and trafficking. I have a I run the sex worker film and arts festival. So that's all there with movies. So oh, wow. super cool, cool, cool movies about sex workers from an activist movies. Do you do that in the Bay Area? If we did do it in the Bay Area, but then we would do it online. I forget. I, I don't think we ever did it only online, but we did it partly online in 2019, and we didn't do right. one in 21. Because, and then now somebody's come to me, and she's Elizabeth Dayton. She's a she's an academic, she's fabulous, mm-hmm. and she wants to do it. She really wants to. So we're going to broaden our diverse membership, and we're going to look towards right. Re- revving it up again yeah awesome. but i think they can find all my stuff my bio is there and there's not much i if i think of anything that's not on it i'll put it on there but with the link tree and twitter and they can talk to me on twitter i am a little lonely so <laughs> <laughs> that's so sweet that's amazing <laughs> well, thank you well, so much for talking to us today. It was yeah, so nice to talk to you. Absolutely, so nice. Well, I, I, it is nice. I mean, this is such a treat and a wonderful thing for me. <laughs> sometimes it makes me so happy. I mean, this, this was my total life. This is, you know, I try, to <laughs> all, I try to pretend it's all I have to do in life. <laughs> I just got to talk to interesting people all day, every day. That would be a good life for me too. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So thank you for chatting with us. That was really enlightening. I can't wait to continue the topic with Caitlin Bailey. Caitlin Bailey is a contrarian by nature and provocateur by trade. Bailey is an internationally touring stand-up comic, sex worker rights advocate, and writer. She came out as a sex worker in 2015 as a stand-up comic with her critically acclaimed one-woman show, Contagious, which sold out performances at New York City Fringe and United Solo Theater Festivals in New York City in 2016. Her biting quotes, personal essays, and op-eds continue to raise awareness in a variety of local and national publications. We could not be more excited to have a chance to speak with Caitlin personally. So let's welcome Caitlin Bailey to the show. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, excited. Yeah, (laughs) me too. Uh, We are as well. Um, Can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, sure. I am a stand-up comic. I am also the host of the Oldest Profession podcast and the founder and executive director of Old Pros. Yeah. And you yeah. guys had a really great uh, event last year. Thank you. We are, we're very excited with what we were able to do in the, uh, in the year 2020. Um, you know, so we, uh, we pulled off the, the January 25th event celebrating the first sex worker-led protest in the U.S., which happened January 25th, 1917. Um, yeah. We've been at this for a while. So. Yeah. <laughs> still fighting. Uh, yeah, yeah, still, still fighting. fighting. Yeah. Still All still right, guys. <laughs> Same story, right? Stop the arrest, <laughs> listen to sex workers, give money to moms, you know, like pretty basic formula. Yeah. Rinse and repeat. So, yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again. Yeah, no wonder we're tired. Um, <laughs> yeah, so tell us a little bit about the like idea of horror and like what a horror is. I know like in your in your one woman show that you're doing, you kind of trace that idea throughout the last 10,000 years or so. <laughs> oh, well, uh, so thank you so much for bringing it to my show. I uh, It's also one of my favorite things. Um, so it's my my second show. It's called Whore's Eye View, where I... Uh, I, I try to go through 10,000 years of history from a sex worker's perspective. And so we start with the origin of the word whore, right? Which is actually Mm -hmm. older than written script. Um, It is always meant uh, harlot, but it comes from words that mean uh, one who desires or more tellingly, a woman who knows, right? And it started out said with like reverent awe, right? You know, um, whores started as priestess prostitutes in ancient fertility temples, right? Where they would celebrate the seasons. And like, you know, if you if you go back on many continents and in many places, uh, if a man wanted to rule, then he had to make a priestess prostitute come super hard. That was like step number one. And if he didn't do that. Why did they do away with that? (laughs) Why did they do away with that? And like what? The SATs were like, this is terrible. And so, and then my favorite part about this is, you know, if he didn't, if the, if the would-be king, right, failed to achieve uh, this role, 
then they ritually castrated him, which again, like, <laughs> you know, can't, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that as a policy solution, obviously, you know, that's like, we're not, we're not fundraising for that. I am, however, suggesting publicly that it worked fine for 10 years. <laughs> So, yeah. So, so anyway, so the whore, so like the word and the concept of whore, obviously we've been demoted over time, but Clearly. it mm-hmm. started said with this kind of reverent awe, right? Where priestess prostitutes were the physical embodiment of, uh, you know, fertility goddesses, right? The, mm-hmm. I, the way I describe it is like if, uh, you know, the Pope and Beyonce were like the same person, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's who these ancient priestess prostitutes were. And in part because temples were so important to the ancient world, right? These are not just yeah. churches, right? These are also brothels and theaters and banks, right? And gathering mm-hmm. spaces and the place mm-hmm. where like collective decision making was made. So, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of power in this. Now we went from being, you know, deified to demonized right where you know the the christian church is you know only the latest in sort of a long trend starting in ancient greece right where we you know we get this idea of paternity which is the obvious predecessor to patriarchy right Mm -hmm. and so the, the we demote fertility goddesses and elevate in their turn gods of war, right? Gods like Apollo, right? Who's just yeah. this, like doofus, basic dude, right? Like, yeah. he, you know, like I imagine him and just like the trendiest, dumbest sunglasses, right? It's gross. <laughs> but whatever. So like, we, whatever, we all fall in love with Apollo and that's fine. Um, it's fine. And we split these, these ancient fertility goddesses, like who, you know, Ishtar, right? Is the goddess of love and war, right? But mm-hmm. no, 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 we get rid of that, right? We have a different God for war and that's a dude. And then God of love is like Aphrodite and she's like obsessed with her hair and like that's like you know <laughs> a new a new age of religion and we have this interim period of you know polytheistic communities where you do still have these goddesses right you have a mm-hmm. role in society for ancient priestess prostitutes they perform ritual rites they're included in civic society courtesans are you know at the table part of the decision makers i mean this is not this is not a utopia like, there are slaves in these cultures right like yeah, not get, first, like first, it's not yeah. chill but, right. you know, but but sex workers have a place. This continues into the Renaissance, right? The Catholic Church is sort of the first to codify, right, the Madonna whore complex, right? Yeah. We, we split the ancient goddess into the virgin mother, right, and the repentant yeah. whore. We name them both Mary and hope that no one would notice. And, <laughs> Uh, and they they wage that that's the first war on whores, right? They wage yeah. a war against heretics, right, and witches, uh, and and queer culture, right. And yeah. even though they are the largest brothel owners in Europe, they do a lot uh, to to really push underground these ancient fertility. Uh, you know, uh, cultures that used to embody a lot of information about birth and the cycles and seasons yeah. and medicine and reproductive health care. It's you know like. Uh, mad props to the French doctors who like discovered the clitoris like 20 years ago, but like we, <laughs> we knew, you know, yeah, like we, we knew, right. We I get it. You know, like, in grad school, you won't believe this. I took a Freud class and he said in the class <laughs> and that the clitoris was discovered in the nineties. LOL. <laughs> oh my God. That's the okay. Of men. <laughs> I cannot. That's great. That's nineties. <laughs> Very funny uh, and very disappointing. Uh, yeah. God, we're so tired. But yeah, it's sorry. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I yeah, PhD, I'm just, and he's claiming that the clitoris was discovered discovered in the nineties. Confidently, I hope he's talking about like himself in his own room. You know, like, I read an article once that there's a button you can push. Uh, fucking nightmares. No, but like you know, like, and and to, to to your point, right? Like medieval doctors, right? Men men who had taken a vow of celibacy to protect mm-hmm. themselves from women's disgusting, leaky, temptress bodies, right? right. Mm-hmm. Were the ones that were like, menstruation is gross, right? Yeah. Birth is punishment. Uh, mm-hmm. Like girls have cooties. Like that's the, that's sort of the OG. And they equate, you know, demonization with disease, right? Which sort of mm-hmm. takes all of the horphobia that had been, you know, developed in this like, you know, cauldron of misogyny, right? As the church, uh, you know, ostensibly start started by the incredible charismatic speaker, Mary Magdalene, uh, is a place where women are not allowed to talk, right? Circle that square, I dare you, right? So the church is like very, very down on this. And so they go from demonization to diseased. And we that that takes us really into the AIDS epidemic, right? And we, yeah. we are still living in a society and a culture that justifies a lot of our horphobic 
legislation um, through the lens of public health and, you know, STI control. Um, mm-hmm. We still live in a place where, you know, a, you know, HIV is criminalized. Um, you, you hear this a lot, uh, not from folks that have done their research, but just from, you know, porphobic politicians trying to justify their decisions. Yeah. But starting in the, the, the 19th century, the late 1890s, early 1910s, really is when it hits a federal level, you add this new dimension that happens to coincide with suffrage, right? So mm-hmm. as women get the legal right to vote, right, and are legally allowed to participate in public spaces, then we get this victim narrative, right, where in order to protect the girls, right, specifically white women, right, the Mm -hmm. white slave law of 1910, we must protect women from their own choices by arresting them and putting them in cages and on lists. It's very important (laughs) for their (laughs) own protection, Right. And, and you're still saying that. And, yeah. and, and so we are still yeah. dealing with that, that double entendre, or not double entendre, we're, we're still dealing um, yeah. with that false characterization. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, one of the things that you're, you're bringing up here, and um, this I really thought was interesting, like in your show that I've seen, that obviously everybody hasn't seen, but also in what you're saying is like this idea of like women coming out like into, into public that like the idea of like a whore prostitute was also like a public woman, a woman who was, yes. can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll, we've just been, you know, you know, prostitution is a legal phrase, right? But the word whore is flexible and vast, right? It used to mean women who could read, you know, like it's, we, it's meant, uh, yeah, women participating in public life uh, or, you know, people, and, and it's interesting I have always conceived of whorephobia as like the pointy end of the sphere, the sphere of misogyny, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, it is intertwined and deeply connected to homophobia and this sort of like battling back women back into their proper place, right? Because whores yeah. are an existential threat to the patriarchal order, right? You can't have a patriarchy in a society that doesn't respect who the dads are, right? And because of biology, right? doesn't matter how many dudes I fuck, I just know it's my baby, that's science. And there's no number of laws that you can write to make that not true. And so, right, right, and so, you know, whores as, um, you know, independent economic uh, actors, right? We've had purchasing power for all of Mm -hmm. human history. We've been able to participate in public life in a way that women who were protecting their chastity uh, would not yeah. or could not do. Mm-hmm. As those boundaries break down, right, I feel like this this effort to diminish women in public space is to turn the heat up on that whorephobia, right? Because it's, yeah. it's so interconnected. Well, it's so effective. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. really what it comes down to. It's, it's so effective. Do you think that sex work has been heavily stimulated or why do you think, I guess, sex, sex work has been heavily criminalized throughout history and coming to now when we used to be, like you said, deified? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Hammurabi wrote our first laws, right? Like, you know, Western, Western Civ for sex workers, right? It's like, <laughs> he's the, the eye for an eye guy. And he conceived of rape laws as a property crime against either a husband or a father, right? And so oh, this wow. is this deep, deep, deep idea that women are property. And I think that sex workers have always sort of existed in defiance of that. Oh, right? yeah. like, we are not merchandise. We are service providers, right? Mm-hmm. We yeah. are, you know, independent agents and mm-hmm. sex workers are able to live in society belonging to neither a father, right, nor a husband yeah. and still accumulate property, which again, yeah. is an existential threat to the patriarchal order, right? Think about how hard we fought for women to be able to main property within mm-hmm. the context of a marriage, right? For, you know, yeah. trying to fight this, um, something covered. Yeah, bank accounts. Yeah, bank exactly. Account. Yeah, like women were allowed to have, married women couldn't have their own credit cards without their husband's knowledge or consent until the mid 70s. Like this is, and it wasn't a crime in the United States for a husband, you know, marital rape was not a recognized crime know, in this country until the mid nineties. Like this is, no. you know, this is recent. This is that's because this that's is- when they found the clitoris. I mean, they're all like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Ah, there you go. All right. Well, now that you know, there's no excuse anymore. I have that conversation a lot. What you touched on too about the patriarchy, because I was trying to explain sex work to someone who you know wasn't very familiar and in layman's terms and all of these things. When like it's always 
a problem or it's problematic to our current day social norms. Whenever a woman steps into their sexuality and is, mm-hmm. it takes ownership of that, yeah. it has all these repercussions that a lot of the men I speak with don't seem to comprehend or they don't mm-hmm. understand why that's an issue or why why it, it plays out the way it does. Yeah. And I think that is basically about criminalizing women's bodies and all yeah. of these things. I, I agree. And I think it really goes back to like women for so, for so many, for so long and in for so many places have really been defined by our, our sexual relationship to the world, yeah. right? Yeah. Our morality mm-hmm. is judged mm-hmm. by that. Our, our literal, like our social worth, our station, our so yeah. much about us, our value is determined by whether and with whom we have sex, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And men, sex is this like, you know, footnote on the rest of their life, which I think Mm -hmm. the Me Too movement is really a correction of. And I think that's where the panic is coming from and this sort of rape culture impulse of like, Mm -hmm. what do you mean you're judging me by my sexual choices? That's not fair. That's only something we do to ladies, you know? And (laughs) and sex sex workers have always existed in open defiance of that, right? Because like once you remove that burden right once it's like mm-hmm. i am no longer protecting my chastity in the name mm-hmm. of some dude's ego right yeah. <laughs> then like it really it really allows you to move more more freely in the world yeah. but you can't you know if your objective is to control the people you fuck right if that's you know yeah. that that i could see why that would be troublesome yeah <laughs> Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think, um, you know, now that you've gone through and kind of combed over the history of attitudes towards like sex work and towards horrors, like, where do you think we are right now? <laughs> do you I, think I would, it's more than normal or do you uh, think? Yeah, no, we're, we're in, we're in heavy back. backlash territory right now, yeah. right? Like, yeah, absolutely. That's, you no, no, no. It, Last week, uh, eBay is threatening to remove erotic content yeah. mm-hmm. from from their yeah, platform. They I think they did it. Yeah, OnlyFans yeah. had that whiplash news cycle. Yeah. Pornhub, like all of we are, we are in the midst of experiencing the fallout from Sesta Fosta, which is a deeply yeah. horrophobic piece, which we warned everyone about. <laughs> know, yeah, sex workers have been screaming about this whole time, and like finally, Twitter is implemented. Right, like right. you know, they're trying to they're tr- they're trying to claim that uh, uh, Elizabeth Nolan Brown has some really great coverage on on what's happening with the, um, I believe it is the National Coalition and um, Exploitation of Children, which used yeah. to be called, uh, more telling me, Morality in Media, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. in addition to being against child pornography, they are also against Cosmo Magazine for its scale <laughs> and scope. Really taking on the big issues here. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I'm fine. So, uh, yeah, so that organization decided not to sue the adult perpetrator that was trying to blackmail um, a teen into giving them more uh, erotic content, uh, but instead went after the platform, uh, which unknowingly allowed that you know transmission of media to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Which is Twitter, right? And so Twitter is like, "What? What? What do you mean?" And sex workers are like, "No, no, no. We we told you yeah. harm reduction. All of the things that kept us safe on the internet, which was mostly our ability to communicate with each other, right. uh, is." Um, being erased and we may be the first but we are not the last yeah um yeah and meanwhile i can hear people in prisons being like we've been trying to tell you but for these you know and it's like yes you're you're right it's um it's foucault's boomerang right we do not inflict onto others things as an empire right we do not inflict onto others things that we will not eventually inflict on on our own citizens that's the that's what Mm -hmm. we do and so when sex workers and prisoners and marginalized folks and like the people that we've detained and I, you know, you don't live through the last three years and not think we are not on an inevitable progressive march forward. That's not what Yeah. Happened. Yeah. I, I've thought about this from a business standpoint from a lot. Like there's a, a real issue in terms of technology and when regulation comes into place through government, because there's such yeah. a lag between the two, but in, yeah. in, reflection of the sex workspace that's almost always to our advantage because we get to access the technology we get to communicate yep. until they realize and then yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the legislation comes through right that's why you know we've always been innovators right yeah and i think that's absolutely. true of um you know a, a lot of you know when, 
the fastest way to create criminals is to outlaw something, you know, and when you push a community, when you push an industry, when you push an economy underground, right, you force a particular kind of innovation. And so, you know, I think that's why sex workers have always been early adopters. Um, And, and I, I think that one of the saddest, um, definitely intended consequences of this long-term criminalization and stigma has been the wisdom and insight and perspective that sex workers bring to any conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I want to hear more from sex workers um, at PTA meetings. I want to hear more from sex workers Mm -hmm. at community board meetings. I want to hear more from, from sex workers at every level. And I think that we can build a more compassionate and a more sustainable society if we listen um, to the voices of the the people that participate in this. The people that know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the- Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The people, exactly. The people yeah. listen to the women who know. You dumb right. fucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's great too because I think that's something that the whole OnlyFans movement coming out of the pandemic has highlighted is that the average sex worker is your next door neighbor. It's the mom at the PTA. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all of these people you know and encounter. Yeah. And it kind of shines that different light on the community, which is great. Yeah. It's all kinds of people doing yeah. all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And yeah. it always has been. You know, yeah. sex workers are everywhere. Right. Which is, yeah. you know, which is why it's a deeply intersectional movement and also why it's a, a you know, a very diverse and in many, you know, divergent, like, you know, right. kind, of, mm-hmm. kind of group. You know, there are mm-hmm. there are absolutely uh, uh, people I don't want to hang out with at parties that are engaged in this work. <laughs> Yeah. Not engaged, you know, that's fine. That's allowed. It yeah. takes all kinds. Yeah, it does. It takes all kinds of kinds for sure. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, um, where can people find you and your work and the things well, that you're doing right now? If you want to be in the know like an old pro, then you got to sign up for our weekly email list. We send up a roundup of sex worker rights related news from around the country and everything that's going on with old pros, including the oldest profession podcast, the old pro news show, my one woman show, stuff we read about in the newspaper. Sometimes we're quoted, sometimes we're not. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's uh, I'm really I'm proud of our newsletter. And I think that, um, you know, if you want to if you want to know more about the sex worker rights movement, um, then tune in to what's going on at Old Pros. And of course, if you want to support our work, you can uh, with a tax deductible donation. Great. And where, what's the site where they can sign up for the newsletter? Right now it is oldproinc.com. Okay. Great. Yeah, old- so thank you. It was really great to talk to you today. Yes, this was amazing. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> thank you. Last but not least, we're going to talk to Femi Babylon and hear her thoughts on the subject. Femi Bambalon, formerly known as Supreme Bay, is the author of a well-received queer poetry book, Libra Season, and a zine titled Ho Thoughts on Terminology and Other Unimportant Things. You may not know that you've heard of them, but if you're on Twitter, you've probably come across some of their tweets. At Thought Scholar, T-H-O-T Scholar, is their Twitter handle, and they have a lot of really unique and enlightening ideas, so I'm really looking forward to this. Let's welcome Femi Babylon to the show. Welcome to the podcast, That Scholar. Um, for anyone that's tuning in and maybe is a little bit less familiar with you than we are, could you introduce yourself briefly? Hi, um, <laughs> That Scholar is my Twitter handle. It actually used to be something more complicated and highly unspellable for a lot of people. <laughs> but um, I tweeted about being a Thought Scholar and then a friend was like, that's it right there. That should be yeah. here your handle because that's the stuff you talk about and I was like I don't know and it's like really fitting and really good it's, it's really just, clever yeah yeah like now it's just like that and like it was available and I was like I can't believe this is available like <laughs> <laughs> and like now it's like I'm like a, a household name sometimes yeah. not in a positive way <laughs> I have like a I have like a like a weird cohort of like anti-fans yeah, I like, do, huh? What, yeah, why? It, I don't know. It's so <laughs> weird, right? Like, and then I yeah. think too, it's also partially because I keep like every time I have like I get dragged for like like I've never been dragged for anything legitimate that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't like related to my personal life. Okay, that stuff that stuff mm-hmm. was somewhat yeah. legitimate. Like, like I um, <laughs> but other than that, like. 
most of the stuff like that's been that I've been dragged over it's been like people just don't like just like they don't agree with me like this the biphobia yeah. stuff like I was writing a lot about biphobia that's what I that's one of the things that I do um I write a lot about like mm-hmm. um what I call pornophobia um mm-hmm. I write a lot about um um race and sexuality and like all of these types of things you know how they intersect sex work erotic labor whatever you want to call it and like I think like the first thing that pissed people off was me like panhandling online I guess is you know they call it it's called, <laughs> I call it like I say like digital panhandling but like you know then it's also called e-begging or whatever I don't know I was a single mom right. when yeah, I um right. and people were like why don't you like I didn't know that was a thing and people were like why don't you put your 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 cash link up and like so we can, you know, help you with the rent. Because I was camming, but I wasn't yeah. making enough. I wasn't making enough money. Yeah. Like, it was, like, very spotty. And But I had yeah. moved out of my grandma's house because, like, of some family issues. Yeah. And um, I put it up. And, like, I was able to pay my rent and get some groceries and stuff. And, like, yeah. you know, I did that until I was, like, able to get, like, a regular income coming in from Patreon of all places. <laughs> and so, <laughs> wow. yeah. So, yeah. Like, yeah, so like that's that's scholar, I guess. Like, it's like that's not like my whole thing. Like people are like really attached to like work that I did in like twenty seventeen for whatever reason. It's terrible. terrible. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, it is weird. I'm really interested in the work that you've been doing like recently and the mm-hmm. theorizing that you've been doing about like sex work and particularly about like this idea of sex work as anti work because you know, in, it's been, you know, since the seventies, we've been talking about like sex work is work and fighting for like the idea that sex work is work. And what I see you doing is saying, stepping back and kind of saying, well, do we really want to be workers? Do we really want to line ourselves up with work? And is there a different way to think about this? And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about why you think it's important to kind of pull away from that or to rethink about that. Okay. Okay. So like I was online and I was like, I don't like this work shit, you know, like, <laughs> like work ethic. And like, I, like, I call my writing my work. Cause I don't know what else to call it, but I have been racking my brain for like three years trying to figure out like how I can describe my work accurately without saying work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's how much I hate it. Because it's just like, when I say work, then people automatically think like, how much money do you make? Like nothing. I don't mm. make Intellectual yeah. property. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And like, yeah. I guess, like, I was like, I'm anti-work. Now, you know, like, every time somebody says something, I guess, like, now, like, this is what I mean about, like, Western thought and, like, kind of this originary thing. Like, we, every, like, you have to figure out who coined what. That's why I took that. Somebody had told me, put like, you coined pro who woman is. And I was like, eh, I guess. And I <laughs> took it out of my bio, like, a while ago because, like, I was like, I don't care. I just, I don't, I don't care. I have yeah. my own thoughts about this thing and I don't, it doesn't matter who coined it. And I just, I just, right. it's, it's tiring. So like yeah. with anti-work, obviously, you know, like I was like, let me go Google this because I don't want to say, you know, like, I don't want to just casually say I'm anti-work and then somebody's like, you got that from here. You mm, know, yeah. like I just literally like the word anti and then work like very simple word. <laughs> and so I looked it up yeah. and I saw that um, like this guy wrote like the right to be lazy. Paul Lafar, Lafargu. Mm-hmm. My French is really bad, okay. But if you look it up, you'll see. He's yeah. like Marx <laughs> or something. And I still oh, haven't read Marx. <laughs> and yeah, like he was a yeah, rumored, wow. he was a rumored There's black. There's people who will tell yeah. you about that. <laughs> yeah, I know like everybody's like, like there's like a cohort of like leftists who are like, you got to read Marx to understand this, this and that. And I'm just like, I'm poor and I feel like I understand enough. Yeah, I'm wondering then, like, are you, uh, then, like, when you talk about, like, sex work as anti work, then, which, like, I think I share, like, a similar sentiment with you. And I don't know if it's because I'm also, like, a mom or something, but my life is, like, way too complicated. I cannot go to work all day long every day because, like, who would take care of all of the, like, logistics of, like, my three kids who all have different things that they need mm-hmm. done and also, like, just, other life things. And so like, for me, um, sex work has been a way that I can 
make money but not have to be somewhere like all day long you know mm-hmm. and so like in that regard um and because I because I like to write like I'm trying to make enough money from sex work that I have more time to write and to do the stuff that I need to do like for my kids so I mean that's kind of I think how I think about it so it's work in so far as like it is a thing I have to do that I'm getting paid for but it's also like a way to not work in the way that I don't want to work. And I'm wondering if like, that's the way that you're conceptualizing this. I think that that is the way that I have to conceptualize this because of the society that I live in. When Mm -hmm. I think of my writing and stuff, I think about it, when I do get paid, I think about it as paid labor. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. I think that in the society that we live in, because we transition to like this, you know, like the ownership of things. Mm -hmm. owning property whether it was people or houses or land or whatever like now we own property and like work is so we can pay for the property that we rent or own finance yeah (laughs) that's what i think of when i think of work you know this is like the first time i've been able to like coherently phrase that awesome i want to like also talk about because a lot of the guests we've had on the show so far they've we've talked about sex workers work and in that base the concepts you know that we've been discussing um and a lot of what we discussed was like how sex workers should have labor rights and things like that do you think that the way you're conceptualizing it damages that ask that that idea of like sex workers should be like treated with labor rights I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. I just no, about no. I'm, I'm curious. So I'm laughing because we live in America. We don't have labor rights. Yeah. yeah. We live in America. <laughs> and that's why it's just so hilarious to me that people are like strangle holding onto this sex work is work thing. Like, you want who's rights? Really? Who's labor rights? Because, yeah. like, if you're talking about feminized labor, get the fuck out of here. If you're talking about industrial <laughs> labor, like, get the fuck out of here. Like, like all of us can't live in New York City, okay, where police have unions and strippers have unions and freaking yeah. masons. Like, everybody has fucking unions in New York City. It's, like, mind-boggling. My partner's from yeah. there, so I'm like, they have a union? Like, there's, like, he's, he's this, he said something the other day about, like, some group of people that I never thought would have a union. And it wasn't strippers. It was some, it was, like, a mundane job that I just never thought about before. I don't know. Anyway, my point is that like they have unions all over the place in New York City, <laughs> but we all cannot be so lucky, you know, as to live in New yeah. York. And like, they're really they're slowly trying to push all the poor people and all the all the all the um, you know, yeah. they're they're trying to push all the poor people and a lot of black people, the immigrants. They're trying to get them the fuck out of New York because they're yeah, like, yeah. So like. I don't know, like, the sex work is work thing is just always, it's hilarious to me because it's like, first of all, like, I think it's, I think it's, I understand the political utility of just like throwing everything under sex work, but Mm -hmm. everything cannot be regulated the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like the main reason we don't want regulations is because this country is garbage. And so like, that's like that's like literally the reason so like everything that we want to do anyway is gonna have to be underground unless we want this government legislating okay because like a lot of people are like we want full decrim which is not a real thing at all but that's Mm -hmm. what people call it decrim or decriminalization was coined with regards to whores so Mm -hmm. it doesn't need any sprinkles on it you know, when the ice cream is good, it's good on its own. And mm-hmm. so <laughs> decrim is like the bottom of the barrel, like of expectations, right? And mm-hmm. so like, mm-hmm. I think people like take sex work as work and they kind of like put it on top of that. And they're like, okay, well now we want labor rights. Honey, if you want labor rights, you want regulations. But no, that's not what I want. I want it to, because that sounds like legalization. Well, no, it doesn't have to be, but like if you don't if we don't come up with something, they're gonna come up with something and we're not gonna like it. Yeah. This is like, I love this conversation because that's yeah. so 
it's a macro yeah. view of something we've been looking at for the past two days, especially yeah. it was so yeah. micro. And it's so interesting because we think about even like compared to legalization of marijuana, right? We want legalization. Okay, well, now we're we're taxed on it. Yeah. And now if you buy it, your ID is scanned. Yeah. And it, has, it comes with all these consequences that I, even in this conversation, is very nuanced to me because I haven't considered that. I have yeah. not considered some of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, mm-hmm. It makes people upset because they don't want to think that hard about it because here's the thing, like, and like, I don't know, people talk about like, like there's like a million books about like, like class guilt, white guilt and all this other stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care. The thing is though, is that like decrim is not going to benefit anybody at the bottom. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's harm reduction at its most bare, like bare minimum. Mm-hmm. It, it's like such a low bar and like. I know that people think that like agitating for labor rights, like like for sex workers specifically, is like a higher bar. But like I encourage people not to like think that. Like just don't mm-hmm. because this is a country that allowed union busting. Like this, that's literally where mm-hmm. we're at. This is a country that is like, you know, like all in up in arms because. Like, how could, how dare you expect me to get paid the same as a plumber when I have three degrees? You know, this is, this is the type of, this is the type of thinking that we're working against, you know, like they don't care about Mm -hmm. labor rights. They don't have rights themselves. And they think they can just put clauses and employment contracts to stop you from doing OnlyFans. Like this, that's literally the country that we live in. So saying sex work is work, you're, 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 it's falling on deaf ears anyway. We don't have labor rights in this country. In order for us to have labor rights, what we need to be doing is forming coalitions with some of these other groups, like mm-hmm. HIV activists and mm-hmm. and like you know LGBTQ organizations and, and stuff like that and whatever. But the problem is the same problem that always exists is that middle class, upper class, or you know in some cases you know white people kind of like dominate these organizations. And like when you're talking like mm-hmm. white gays and stuff, like you're talk like like marriage equality, who was that for? That wasn't for us. What is what is marriage yeah. doing for anybody who's poor? It wasn't for poor white people, it wasn't for poor black people, it wasn't it, was, it wasn't for immigrants, it wasn't for anything. It was for upper crusty white yeah. white people. You know, like it was mm-hmm. for them because they benefit from getting married. And everybody said that and then like, oh yay, the gays can get married. But who's getting married? People with money. Yeah. And so like, you know, yeah. like the rest of us are just kind of like whatever. And so I think that, you know, yeah. like that kind of like people get stuck. We you know, when when you when you say it like that, they're like that's so depressing. Oh my god, like there's nothing we can do. There are things we can do. People just don't want to do them cuz people don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. You know, like like COVID and everything like that, you know, like, you know, they didn't mandate these masks and shit, so people aren't going to fucking do it. They didn't, yeah. they not, they're not going to deliver groceries and they're not going to, they're not going to build hospitals in a day or in a weekend or something like they're not going to do those things. They have the money, they have the, the things to do because money is fake. Okay. They could build hospitals. They could build more stuff. They could build more ICU units and everything, but they don't want to because they don't care. And that's what, mm-hmm. that's the, literally the framework we're working within. So saying, you know, we yeah. want labor rights in a country where they don't care about laborers and don't give laborers rights doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, that makes me wonder. So like when you say there are like, because I'm, I'm evolving my school of thought during this conversation. Yeah. So even like you saying now there are things we could do. What are the things then? Cause now I'm at a loss. I'm like, okay, so now, now what? <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 you that's just what shattered happened. my whole world with you. So like, that's what I, was there, I was there and I was like, well, what can we do? Well, for me, I don't know what we could do at a macro level. Mm-hmm. Right. Like for like I had to start with tiny things, you know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to break it down for myself, because that's where I was, I was like, oh my God, like what can we do? Like if, if work and we don't have labor rights. I was reading labor histories and I was like, we don't have any of this shit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. And we're just whores. We're not minors. You know, yeah. like <laughs> they don't care about them anymore either. Like what is like, I was just like, oh. <laughs> and part of me is still there because I'm like, dog, like, okay, like these people want solutions. I'm just one person. Like, yeah. Like, I'm, like, what can we do? So I started thinking like on an individual level, I, I talked about this before. Like when I mentioned brothels online, everybody rushed again to tell me, 
that we can't have brothels because regulations this and regulations that and this and that and whatever and all of this stuff as if I would ever try to like make brothels like really legal like that. you know I'm just I'm just throwing some ideas out there though <laughs> but what I was what I was thinking to myself because like sometimes I feel like I can't say certain shit on Twitter you know yeah but when I talked about brothels what I really had in mind was like what if we just had like you know, like, you know, like, have you ever heard of the farm Mm-mm. for like having babies? Is it Ina May? Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Her name Ina? Ina? Is it Ina? Ina May? Ina May? Ina May? Something like that. Ina May? Okay, but you know what I'm talking about. The spiritual midwifery yeah. lady. Yeah. Okay, so like they started like a whole town or whatever. These like yeah. hippie mm-hmm. white people, they start like a whole town. It's like the farm and people go down there and right. have babies naturally and like yeah. all that orgasmic birth stuff. But sometimes it's just like they're just having the baby naturally and stuff like that. And like they have. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So like when I, that's what I think about when I, that's what I was thinking about when I thought about brothels, like some underground shit. Yeah. Like we all, we all rent this stuff and like co-ops and stuff like that. Like whenever people hear these terms though, they think like within the framework that we already like exist in. So yeah. they're like coming down, going down the list of like all these things that we can't do and stuff because rules and like, I don't give a fuck <laughs> about rules, you know? Like, so like, I never think, I never really think about those types of things. Like people be like, that's illegal. And I'm like, I, gotta, I just don't understand what legality has to do with anything in a system that was imposed upon me and my people. Like, I didn't ask to come here. My ancestors didn't ask to come here. I don't yeah. have to follow these laws. Like, yeah. and that's just how I feel. That's just how I feel about it. You know, like, yeah. I can get with my community and we can create our own laws. Like, mm-hmm. and the thing is that like, they don't want people, they don't want regular people to do that. You know, like the Amish right. had to even fight for their mm-hmm. little, you know, their little, their little shit and whatever. And the only reason mm-hmm. they were yeah. able to even make it is because they had the right skin tone, but they were not, right. they were, they were, they were fucking with the Amish too, you know? So, yeah, right. I don't know. Like, <laughs> so my- where can people find you and your work? On Twitter. That's, that's where I do most of my talking right. until I finish this book. That's where I'm, that's where I'm at. I have a Patreon, yeah. but I, I, I never post there. Like it's so the Patreon exists to support my Twitter because like I post on Twitter a lot, but sometimes I feel bad that I don't really post anything but announcements on Patreon because I think people expect you to post like extra content, mm. you know, oh, and yeah. stuff. Like that. I'm just one person. Like I just I don't have time. Yeah, like, I yeah. literally don't have time. So well, I'm working on this. It makes me feel better. I support your Patreon, and I don't even notice mm. if you post or not because I just. <laughs> Support people I want to yeah. on Patreon. I don't actually have any expectations. <laughs> you're me. You're me as a patron. I'm a patron of a couple of people, and I'm just like, I you're, forgot I was even a patron. Like, <laughs> you're, you're someone I really <laughs> wish would get the super follow because, like, like that mm-hmm. for the thought and the concepts you put out would be remarkable. Right. So yeah, yeah. but yeah, right. find me on Twitter. Don't look for my Instagram. I don't post there. I hope I hope more people do. I hope more people reach out and read your work. And I, I don't know how much is it's a new podcast, but I hope it helps because I think that challenging the conversations and it's fucking important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That was a lot. <laughs> that was like amazing. Moral win. Yeah. yeah. All three of these guests like blew my mind. Yeah, they I- did. They broke my brain. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's interesting because I, so some of these ideas are like the historical piece I wasn't as familiar with in general. Yeah. Um, I didn't know where a lot of this stuff originated from. I'm clearly a bad sex worker. Just put it out there. (laughs) I feel feel like I should know this, but also like, I like that I was challenged by it. Yeah. 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 Like the history that Caitlin laid out is so interesting to me. Yeah. It actually made me like, oh, if I could go back in time, I would totally be a priestess prostitute. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I want to like come up out of the water. Yeah. And be like worshipped, and I want to be the one that like I'm the, the goddess. The kings like have to make come. Yes, like, I mean we or... should go back to that era yeah. if we can. <laughs> just for a little. Yeah, oh, having wow. like about us and our pleasure, like we should take that back. Yeah, we should Instead take of, that like, back. Thinking about like, oh, this is a service for the dudes. We can be yeah. like, no, these dudes use the service. Raise me. the bar <laughs> for all Johns everywhere. That's important. Yeah, that's really important. And then yeah. with Carol, like the how you know the term sex work came to be coined, that's fascinating too, because it is. that's really a shift in concept at yeah, that time, you right. know? Yeah. And it was so like, I love talking to her. It was yeah. so interesting to be like, to hear like how she came 
like up in this like sex work yeah. um, with this like feminist sex work consciousness, especially since like, like as an academic, when I like studied like anti-sex work and I think about like this, the six seventies and mm-hmm. the eighties and the anti um, anti-sex work, anti-porn movement, which is picking up steam again, again unfortunately, but um to hear her, like, as someone who was, like, centered in that. And lived be, it. To live it and be like, I'm a feminist and that's why I'm a whore. It and also like- the <laughs> fact that she was wearing, for those who are listening and not watching the video version of this, sh- her shirt said whores on it. Like, it's just amazing to see that. <laughs> like, Wait, it was what did incredible. it say? It said whore. Whore. I want to. Whore nation. Yeah, whore nation. It said whore nation. Yes. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. It was so, pretty awesome. Yeah, so, like, to, to hear her talk about that, to hear her talk about, like, how she was out and how um, she was out not just, like, as a former sex worker, which a lot of people feel like they have to do, um, for political reasons. Yeah. And I understand that I'm not like, you know, disparaging yeah. that at all, but to hear somebody talk about like why they're out and how they navigated the world that way, was great because I'm also someone who's out and has to navigate yeah. the world. And it was good to hear her say like, no, you know, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Even just like the yeah. a- anecdotes of it. Like I was on stage talking about this at a time where people didn't want to hear about this. Yeah. And then like to be ha- heckled at the end and like people have all these p- opinions formed around you. Yeah. It's kind of like, like the first to do something like yeah. you blaze the trail for people to come after right. you. And that was fascinating. Yeah. It was like interesting. I almost had this feeling when we were talking to her, like, you and I are sitting here right now talking about this because, because she did yeah. what she did. <laughs> she did what she did. Even the I word. Feel like she's like our, our our mother. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like indebted because like you coined the term sex work, which I I wouldn't yeah. have. I it didn't cross my mind. And then now I have a platform called Sex Work CEO. Yeah. So like I owe you a debt of gratitude for being able to be where we're at now. Yeah. It's fascinating. Right. But then Moses Moon came along and like yeah, thoughts color <laughs> broke our brain because like now that I finally wrapped my head around the concept of sex work is work and the labor and we talk about rights later in the season yeah. and all of these pieces and then to be challenged with that be like no sex work is also it's anti-work it's yeah challenging to, to, that right to challenge it to be like why do we want to line ourselves up with those like nine to five folks and i'm like yeah no, i don't want to do that yeah and then to think <laughs> about even labor rights in the way that that they described where it's like, you know, there are no labor, all labor in the U S is exploited. It's like, well, Oh shit, you're right. And I didn't think about that. (laughs) This moment when we were interviewing them and you were like, well, but if we don't embrace it as work, like how are we going to get labor rights? And then they just started laughing. (laughs) Yeah. They just laughed at me. Oh, oh, I get it now. Like it's, 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 it's soaking in. It's, it's processing. My brain was buffering, but we're here now. And I understand that was fascinating. Yeah, it was good. I really liked, um, like the whole thing. I think it helped me to, um, think about like where we are right now. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to like put out in our first episode, an overview of how we got to where we are yeah. and how we think about sex work. And, you know, I, we hope that, we intentionally didn't bring on people like everyone who affirms the way that we think about yeah, sex work that was important. Um, or even people who affirm like the notion of like that have the same idea or the same experiences in sex work yeah. um, as each other. Like what we really wanted to do, we're glad that they like broke our brain. And what we yeah. really wanted to do <laughs> is bring together people of various um, perspectives and perspectives, yeah. um, positions um, to talk about uh, what this industry is that we work and live in and what the challenges are. So yeah. um, we welcome that. Yeah, we um, want we want <laughs> conflicting ideas because I feel like that's what actually genuinely furthers the conversation. That's so yeah. important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I also would, I really want each episode to kind of come away with like a tangible business takeaway because I know the sex workers that tune in and the rest of the audience members um that's a value like something that they can take away put into practice and make sense of in the real world if you're a sex worker and you're operating in the same spaces that we are so i think from what i got out of this the main takeaway is just that you really need to understand the history of where an industry comes from to understand Mm -hmm. where it's going to go and what it's shaping up to be because a lot of these issues repeat themselves as we clearly yeah. know I Carol mean, pointed out. That, yeah we see that later and i mean that that's true with uh, the political um framework of how people are thinking about sex yeah. work now that's kind of a, a re-emergence uh Catherine mckinnon was resurrected yeah <laughs> this, this literally last week you know literally so i think that like the um it is important to know where things came came from in order for us to know where they go also i think like you know you and i have been in this industry for long enough that we've seen um 
cycles repeat themselves Absolutely. over and over again too. And I think that especially for like, for the babies um, <laughs> who, you know, who get really, really afraid when things like OnlyFans, uh, when the things like what happened with OnlyFans come about or any, any change of terms of service or yeah. anything that impacts our work. And we understand the fear, but I think that the people who've been in the industry long enough are like, I'm like, oh, it was about time. Let's, let's pack up. This place is over. We're going to move on. Yeah, yeah. no, that's and true. I, and I think that it's good to have that perspective because, you know, I've been at a show um, that Caitlin Bailey did, her one woman show on, on, um, on the war on whores. And I think that like, uh, our a whores I view. A whores I view. That's right. And I think that one of the things that she says in it, that's that she didn't say in the interview, but it's really important is she says like, uh, I have news, I have good news and bad news. Um, uh, not much has changed. Yeah. You know? And so I think understanding that like, there's, um, that we, we are like, um, a stigmatized mm-hmm. and in some cases marginalized and in some cases criminalized population. But, um, we're also a resilient one. Like sex yeah. isn't going anywhere. So it's been here forever <laughs> before all the other things and all the challenges that it's facing. It's, uh, it's adaptive. It's, it's right. That's what we're good at. I mean, we're early yeah. adopters. We move, we pivot. We're, we're strong in that, in that yeah. aspect. So, right. so, so yeah. So getting kind of a, a, an overview of what this has looked like and what it can look like, I think is really important to, to, to roll with the punches. Yeah. Because there's a lot of punches. Yeah, and there's more coming. So uh, <laughs> stay tuned for our next episode. Yeah. Thanks for joining us.